historical a synopsis of Saturnian cosmology from John Cook's website, saturniancosmology.org. There will be a link in the description. He gets pretty deep. The chapters of this site will propose that the biology of our planet, our culture, our psychology, and our very existence are the result of a series of incidents arising from the interaction between Earth and other planets within the solar system, most notably Saturn. The biology of Earth is such that a complete accident, and so utterly unlike it will not have ever been duplicated anywhere at any time among the billions of other star systems. But here on Earth, all of it, especially the rise of complex species since the Cambrian period 560 million years ago, can be attributed to a series of cataclysmic plasma strikes by Saturn, each of a very long duration. Biologists claim 10,000 years for the extinction events. My original estimate was 15,000 years. As hominids, we survived the last externally induced extinction event, which gave rise to eight competing subspecies over the course of the last three million years. Our only contribution to our distinction from other animals was the invention 10,000 years ago of language and its subsequent cultural transmission that set the stage for further development of our humanity. Much later on, and much closer to our time, subjective consciousness. It all started very long ago, at one time, and from its genesis, Earth was a planet in orbit around Saturn, a brown dwarf star, toward the end of the Precambrian, 600 million years ago. The Saturnian system intersected with the solar system. Saturn was swept around the sun and back into deep space to return at regular 26 to 27 million year intervals over the course of time, some of the satellites, planets of Saturn, were wrenched from their orbits around Saturn to end up revolving around the Sun instead. The Earth likely became a solar system planet at the end of the Permian 250 million years ago. From 600 million years ago, Saturn kept entering the solar system regularly to disturb its lost satellites, now circling the Sun. At about 3 million years ago, Saturn likely had a run-in with Jupiter, a solar system planet at that time, orbiting the Sun at a distance probably somewhat less than the Earth's orbit today. The orbital period of Saturn was significantly reduced as a result. During the last 3 million year period, Saturn started scavenging its lost satellites, and perhaps solar system planets, all in orbit close to the Sun. The possibility of a captured planet again orbiting Saturn at its equator is virtually nil. Instead, the scavenged planets ended up in superpolar or subpolar locations, the only locations which seem to be dynamically stable. Because Saturn had come in from outside of the solar system, and most likely was a star originally, it would have been at a very high positive charge level, distinct from the solar system planets. Solar system planets would have been attracted to Saturn when Saturn entered the solar system, rather than be repelled as would be the case of two planets with nearly equal values of charge. Saturn with its stack of captured planets was seen by hominids Homo erectus and recorded in the shapes of artifacts in the Paleolithic of about two million years ago, and by humans Homo sapiens as carved images in the Upper Paleolithic from 30,000 BC and by the hundreds of millions during the early Neolithic 10,000 to 3,000 BC when the stack of planets was much more frequently seen. At about 10,900 BC Earth, at that time a planet of the Sun, made an electric field contact with Saturn, causing 1500 years of darkness. Oh yeah, shadow on Earth. The period of darkness is recognized by many of the world's creation myths, and was recorded in the illustrated graphic books of Mesoamerica, references to which are made in colonial period documents. Climatologically, the period is identified today as the Younger Dryas when for some 1500 years Earth got as cold as it had ever been. 
Over the next 7,000 years, the orbit of Earth, apparently equal to the orbit of Saturn at that time, but below Saturn, progressively moved laterally to have Earth's orbital path eventually travel below the center of Saturn. Thus, between 10,900 BC and 3147 BC, Earth was part of a strange configuration of stacked planets, a condition which provided long summers and a mild climate in the northern hemisphere. Planets dominated by the giant form of Saturn stood above the north, the north horizon and close to Earth, but measured in millions of miles, and were taken by humans to be gods, who supported them and for whose benefit they labored at agriculture and conducted trade. Initially, during a 1500-year period after 10,900 BC, when the cold of the Younger Dryas set in, and long before Saturn was clearly seen, three fiercely lighted ball plasmoids were seen far south of Earth. Below the South Pole, between about 10,900 BC and 8347 BC, these connected to Saturn and the North via strands of brilliant arcs of electrons. Forms of various shapes ran south over these electron lines, traveling toward the three plasmoids. The moving shapes were taken to be dead animals and dead humans. The objects in the sky became the basis for all original religions and a good deal of mythology throughout the world, for they persisted in showing nightly and seasonally over the course of 2500 years to 8347 BC although only for three periods of hundreds of years. For the people of Mesoamerica, the year 8347 BC, when the last of the plasmoids extinguished after 2500 years, was the end of their first tally of years, which accounted for the first creation. We know only a little about these ball plasmoids from obscure mythological references, and we would still not know very much if it had not been for an investigation undertaken by a team led by Anthony Pratt of Las Alamos National Labs of some four million petroglyphs worldwide, carved high up on mountainsides facing in all directions, but always with a clear view toward the south. That study, published in the journal IEEE Transactions on Plasma Science in 2003, was an absolutely astounding revelation. More on that in a later chapter. In 4077 BC, Saturn dropped its coma. This had been the chaos before creation, which had lasted some 7,000 years. It had obscured Saturn and its companion satellites. Saturn went nova. It switched to arc mode in a mass expulsion. Saturn produced its rings and a new satellite, Venus, and perhaps another. That's interesting. So. They're saying that Venus came from Saturn and not Jupiter, like Golikovsky does. Okay. And Saturn lit up more brilliantly than the Sun to the humans of Earth, who had not clearly seen the real Sun for thousands of years because of the shadow of the younger Dryas, followed by the obscurity of the enclosing plasmosphere of Saturn. This was the start of creation, start of time, and the first showing of the land and its resident gods, the satellites of Saturn. Saturn was universally called the sun throughout the world. In Central America, the Papal Vu, written circa AD 1600 from much older records, recounts, like a man was the sun when it showed itself. It showed itself when it was born and remained fixed in the sky like a mirror. Certainly it was not the same sun which we see. It is said in their old tales. In arc mode, Saturn would have lost its glow mode coma, but it apparently retained a plasma stream connection to Earth. The sun, and the real sun, lighted part of the edge of Saturn in a crescent, which revolved around Saturn on a daily basis, visually caused by a daily rotation of Earth below Saturn. This stack of planets consisted from top to bottom of Uranus on its side as today and Neptune, both hidden by Saturn below them, known in Mesoamerica from earlier times. I suspect that these three planets had been seen together for perhaps two million years. 
initially by Homo erectus. Below Saturn, the following were located from top to bottom. Mercury joined the group in about 14,000 BC. Mars, resident probably since at least 30,000 BC or earlier, and Earth joined the group after 10,900 BC. In 3147 BC, this configuration of standing planets broke apart, with three large planets moving far away from the Sun, and Earth, and Venus, released to overlapping inner orbits. The breakup produced a stupendous flood of the waters, which had been held at the south polar region due to the gravitational attraction of Saturn for some 7,000 years. The water held at the south pole was due to the lifting up of the Earth's crust in the Arctic and the sinking toward the Earth's interior in the Antarctic. Flood stories are ubiquitous, found in over 500 independent myths, all with the same coherent details. The survivors included people far inland and those living already on mountain slopes, and apparently the people of the Nile Delta and northern Mesopotamia. The only recourse to a livelihood for many of the survivors was agriculture, which soon sprang up simultaneously in six unconnected regions of Earth. The breakup was caused by Jupiter, which had circled the Sun as an inner planet up to that time. Jupiter was subsequently seen receding in the skies, surrounded by a coma visually three times larger than the diameter of the Moon today. Below the south pole of Jupiter extended a gigantic plasma outpouring, making it look like Jupiter was resting on a mountain. It was green initially. Above the planet were much smaller horn-like extensions. The whole of this looked like a person in a mantle, but was also identified as the Bull of Heaven. Jupiter was taken as the new god, called the Younger. Jupiter retained its massive lower outpouring until it entered the asteroid belt in about 2860 BC, after which the coma reduced in size and changed its shape. After 3070 BC, Mars and Mercury, which had remained in their positions below Saturn, were released when Saturn entered the asteroid belt. The two planets crossed Earth's orbit for about 300 years, overriding the Earth's orbit close to Earth on a 30-year or 15-year average intervals. At those times, Mars was at times brought into plasma contact with Earth, looking like a squat mountain which circled the Earth. The visual effect of the rotation of Earth, with Saturn and Jupiter both disappearing into the ecliptic. Mars was held to be the god in charge of Earth, Horus of the Egyptians. This lasted till about 2750 BC or 2700 BC, after which the regular visits of Mars ended its elliptical orbit, perhaps rotating away from Earth, an apocidal procession. In the next century, people throughout the world start building pyramids in imitation of the disappeared mountain of Mars, all within a hundred years of each other, in Egypt, Mesopotamia, England, China, and the Andes of South America, and many other locations such as Greece and the Balkans, as has been discovered in recent years, although not validated. We have recorded histories of these celestial events, especially in Mesoamerica, there are accurate descriptions of the rings and the number of satellites of Saturn, the cloud bands and satellites of Jupiter, and the scarred surface and satellites of Mars, all dating from antiquity spanning cultures worldwide. The Egyptians produced schematic images of the original configuration of Saturn and the satellite planets below and have a record of early close passes by Mars. Mesopotamians also produced images of planets graphically showing, for example, all the satellites of Jupiter. The Maya, from Olmec sources, have an undated record of the planetary movements from long before 3147 BC, and a dated record of later events which matches what can be gleaned from Eastern Mediterranean sources. The Aztecs produced graphic images of these planets, although anthropomorphized, to gods and produced very late. South Sea Islanders have similar records of rings of Saturn. India has similar recollection of these events extending over millions of lines of poetry. The Quiche, Maya, Papa Vu, and pages of the Maya books of the Chilambalam 
makes casual reference to the period of 13,000 years ago. After the near collision of Saturn and Jupiter in 3147 BC, both Saturn and Jupiter began moving in slow spiral orbits away from the Sun toward the asteroid belt. Probably 10,900 BC. One page of the Chillum Balum records seven appearances of the Saturnian planets as far back as perhaps 40,000 years, which can be collated with atmospheric carbon-14 records dating from 50,000 BP. Over the next 2,500 years, 3147 BC to 685 BC, the inner planets interfered with Earth at intervals, although very infrequently. There were four major additional incidents. The damage often was localized in latitude, although, for example, a continuous lightning strike might have encircled the globe in circa 1492 BC, and certainly repeatedly in the 8th and 7th century BC. As recalled by nearly all peoples on all continents, the most terrifying incident, however, happened in 2349 BC. Saturn, with the planets Mars and Mercury, still in a polar alignment below, entered the asteroid belt in 3067 BC. The gravitational and electrical effects of entering the asteroid belt released Mars and Mercury from below Saturn, and they started moving in highly elliptical orbits. These orbits brought both planets back through the asteroid belt at their aphelions, and Mars and Mercury pulled swarms of objects of various sizes from the belt back with them through the inner solar system. These objects were known as Maruts, or the Terrible Ones, and manifested as comets and meteorites that terrorized the Earth's population for many centuries to come. When in alignment with Venus, 20 million miles away at the time, 32,200,000 kilometers, produced an Earth shock in the northern hemisphere, tilting the Earth's axis away from the Sun temporarily and tilting up the equatorial rings of the Earth. Earth at one time had equatorial rings. This was followed perhaps six hours later by the arrival of a massive disconnected plasmoid lightning bolt from Venus, which hit the rings almost broadside, followed somewhat later by lesser bolts recorded in Mesoamerica and China. The electric contact with Venus turned the equatorial rings blood red and caused the destruction of the rings. Lightning bolts arc up to the rings from the Earth's ionosphere layers and the lower equatorial plasma toroid, the Van Allen belt. The sky bled for three days and only a single ring remained. Dust continued to rain down for the next 4,000 years until AD 1600. The cleared southern skies previously obscured by the Earth's rings revealed a multitude of stars for the first time, most notably the Pleiades, located directly south at midnight, two nights after the equinox. The equatorial plasma toroid would have also arced to the surface of Earth, producing months of torrential rains. To humanity, the sea of the Earth's equatorial rings in the south sky, the Absu, had collapsed to Earth and the event was almost everywhere understood as a second flood of stupendous proportion. The Bible recalls this event as the flood of Noah, but to most peoples, the blood seen in the sky suggested the wholesale slaughter of humanity, and any number of raging goddesses or dragons were assigned to this event in mythology worldwide. Kali, Tiamat, Anath, Sekhmet, Hathor, and much later, Beowulf's Grindel. After two and a half days, Jupiter appeared again with its previous giant coma and lower mantle, again understood as a mountain, as if risen from the dead. In fact, the rise of the equatorial in the sky made it look as if Jupiter rose up out of the cave previously seen as the shadow of the Earth on the rings. The cave-shaped shadow opened up as the Earth regained its normal inclination, and Jupiter rose out of this to a location above it. Jupiter had stopped the dragon from killing additional humans. The event itself remains commemorated as the Day of the Dead, which is why they wear Halloween masks on Halloween. It's so that the spirits don't recognize them, the ones that might want revenge. I believe that's what that's about. And is almost universally associated with the culmination of the Pleiades in autumn. Echoes of the fall of the rings and the surrounding circumstances 
continued to resound in mythology and to this day in the theologies and practices of many religions, especially the resurrection of Jupiter on the third day. Many nations also date the start of all sensible history and their calendars from this event. Strangely, this event is simply not noted by any of the catastrophists. Even Velikovsky remained unaware of it. Hmm, interesting. 800 years later, in 1492 BC, Venus again made an electric contact with Earth, causing a crushing repulsive blow in the East Central Pacific. The Pacific Islands were wiped clean of any trace of humans, except for the petroglyphs carved on every island thousands of years earlier. Coastal South America and Central America were inundated with water, leaving seawater traces in lakes high up in the Andes and possibly causing a sudden rise in the coastal range of the Andes by thousands of feet. The blow was followed by an electric arc traveling through the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and part of India, following a path of increasingly higher latitude into the Mediterranean as the Earth's axis angled back toward the Sun. Moses made his escape from Egypt during the turmoil. The event is recalled in mythology as the attack of the monster Typhon, who was struck down by Zeus. The major result of the contact was a 30% increase in the orbit of the Earth. The year went from 273 days to 360 days. Venus probably came no closer than 10 million miles. In this instance, 16 million kilometers. Something else was initiated at this time. The movement of tribes away from devastated areas and failing climates into new regions happened after 1492 BC. Tribes of Central Asia entered India, Anatolia in Greece. Tribes from Asia Minor settled in Italy, as well as at later dates also. People everywhere met strangers, and had to cope with new living conditions. This resulted in an expansion of our imagination as a way of coping with these changes. The development of subjective consciousness. Before this time, there was little need to deal with change. The people of Egypt and Mesopotamia, for whom we have records, have remained stagnant in the way of life of their forebears for thousands upon thousands of years. The development of subjective consciousness, as opposed to mere consciousness, was a cultural innovation and a major change which made us humans. Subjective consciousness came to be taught to children by parents, exactly like language is taught. The teaching of subjective consciousness, like the teaching of language, can be readily observed today. Note 5. Another 700 years later, 806 BC to 687 BC, Mars closed in on Earth with repeated electric arc contact at 15-year intervals. A major Earth shock in 747 BC and a minor shock in 686 BC, this last caused by Mercury. Earlier, Mars also interfered with Earth in a similar fashion at the close of the early Bronze Age, 1935 to circa 1700 BC, which includes the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mars came close, perhaps within 40,000 miles of Earth. The interactions, as a result, were completely different from the long-distance shock due to Venus. The destructions of the 8th and 7th century BC were spread over long stretches from Central Asia to the Western Mediterranean and through to Mexico and Southern United States. From the Persian Plateau to Greece, in swaths measuring more than 600 miles wide, hilltop citadels were destroyed by quick-like convulsions much more extensive than any earthquake, and by massive lightning strikes. Cities and citadels were buried under yards of carbonized material mixed with soil. The soil and burned forest were dropped whenever the traveling lightning bolt paused at a hilltop. Oh, that's pretty crazy. I mean, this lightning bolt traveling around just going anywhere. These simultaneous destructions have been noted in the archaeological record and include the events of the 8th and 7th century as well as 1935 BC. De Grazia estimates that only 2.5% of the original population of 200 million of the Mediterranean region survived. Bolsena, a city in Italy, was obliterated by a lightning bolt measuring more than 5 miles 8 kilometers in, in diameter. If we are to believe plenty who presents this from older Etruscan sources. The circular lake at Bolsena, the circular lake at Bolsena is larger than any volcanic caldera. Mars became the next sky god to set a tone for human conduct lasting to this day. 
the destructions of the 8th and 7th century BC obliterated the coastal areas of Greece and coastal Anatolia. The remnant population turned to raiding and became the pirates celebrated in the Iliad as the Egyptian people of the sea. The Iliad reveals that these were no sailors. Warfare and the extraction of tribute also became a way of life for the Assyrians, who plundered from Elam to Egypt. The change in humanity, however, which suddenly brought up, brought people up to our current expectations, was an event which happened early in the 7th century BC. In 685 BC, Venus and Mercury blazed as bright as the sun and were seen in the daytime skies with the sun for 40 days, starting on June 15th. The event was probably an extraordinary plasma outpouring by the sun, brought on by a sudden relocation of Mercury to within the orbit of Venus in the previous year. In July 685 BC, actually the astronomical year minus 685, corrected from 680 BC, Julian in the Eastern Mediterranean chronology, Ah, okay, so that's what the minus is for. It's different. It's astronomical. Okay. Jupiter also erupted with a coma in response in... Jupiter also erupted in a coma in response to the Sun's increased output of plasma, and on July 14th sent a return lightning stroke, a plasmoid bolt headed for the Sun. It arrived at the Sun on July 25th. The plasmoid, which, which passed by the Earth at a distance of 30 million miles, 48 million kilometers, was seen in foreshortened form by Asia and Europe. How about that Jupiter taking a swing at the sun? <laughs> and is depicted in sculptures and illustrations and even on coins. Mediterranean nations thought that Venus, or Mercury, was struck. The bolt from Zeus, which toppled Phaethon, from the sun's chariot. Mesoamerica saw the plasmoid at full length as it passed by in the daytime. That would be wild to see something like that, and depicted it correspondingly differently. Their understanding was that Mars was struck. It was called the bundle of flame. Among the Maya, to China this was the celestial dragon, the traditional form of which matches the structure of a plasmoid lightning bolt. Note 6. One could spend a lot of hours on this website here with this. This is amazing. Um, got a little bit more to go here. As experienced by Earth, the after effect of the 40 days of extreme solar activity was the relocation of the polar axis from Ursa Major to near Ursa Minor and the delay of spring by some 15 days. In effect, changing the inclination of the polar axis, which is equivalent to rotating the dome of the stars. A new equinox was suddenly established, the aphelion of the Earth's orbit. The location furthest from the Sun changed, and 120 years of interference by Mars and Mercury came to a sudden halt. It appeared to many that Jupiter, the historical supreme god of antiquity, had again saved mankind from destruction. The change in aphelion had resulted in a cessation of further interactions with Mars. In 670 BC, the Earth's orbit became nearly circular, for unknown reasons. And the Earth was in fact completely removed from any future interference by any of the inner planets. It's probably the Sun's uh, magnetic sphere, I'd imagine. Within 100 years of this event, we see the simultaneous rise of philosophical studies, much as we understand them today, in China, India, Mesopotamia, Anatolia, North Africa, and Rome well before there was any cultural transmission before the more distant regions on the list, in this list. It appeared to many as if a far greater power beyond the dome of the stars had moved the stars and planets and restarted the universe. For many years of the philosophers, the causes for natural phenomena were now sought elsewhere than in the whims of old planetary gods. With the realization of the existence of a power beyond the planets and stars, we also see the sudden rise of all the modern religions within the span of 100 years. Taoism and Confucianism in China, Jainism and Buddhism in India, with its subsequent influence on Hinduism, 
Zoroastrianism in Persia. With its influence on Judaism, Mithraism, Christianity, and eventually on Islam. Similar changes seem to be attested to in Mesoamerica, probably dating from 600 BC. Could all this really have happened? Religions have attempted to explain all of it, initially as narrations of the observed events, eventually as metaphors of spiritual states. Science, on the other hand, has spent the last 200 years denying that anything at all ever happened. But look at the histories, what we call myths of people from regions as diverse as China, Mesopotamia, and Mesoamerica will reveal that they are in complete agreement with each other. Add to these various myths of the people of India, South America, Africa, Greece, and thousands of others, and a consistent picture of the past emerges, which is not what science tells us. Or flyover regions, for example, of the western United States, and you will soon be convinced that the waves of hills the conical dumps of wind-borne soil, the distorted folded mountains, the widely varied landscape cannot possibly be the result of eons of slow movement and metamorphosis of the Earth's crust. The surface of the Earth appears to have been battered and racked convulsively and widely varied landscape and recently. Except for geology, which I will not really touch on, the remaining chapters will fill in the details and broaden the scope for major events. The four events are the end of the Age of the Gods and the worldwide flood of 3147 BC, the fall of the Absu, known as the Flood of Noah, the blood in the sky, the resurrection of Jupiter and the first appearance of the Pleiades, 2349 BC, the defeat of Typhon and the exodus of Moses from Egypt in 1492 BC, and the blazing of Venus and Mercury and the thunderbolt of Jupiter which toppled Phaethon in 685 BC. The last few chapters present an excursion into the site plans and iconography of Mesoamerica from about 2000 BC. In these last chapters you will find that the more closely detailed findings from Mesoamerica will match and often exceed the information available from the Eastern Mediterranean.